So here's something interesting that I had to make a mistake to find. Um, this is just a acoustic four string bass. Um, really what it is doesn't matter. It's, it's uh, what I found with it. So I was doing a setup and uh, you know, set the, the neck relief with a dial gauge and my dial gauge was set incorrectly. It wasn't zeroing out. So I ended up with around 30 thousandths of back bow. Yeah, it's a lot, but uh, for an acoustic bass, it happens. So then I took straight edge and was gonna cut a saddle. So you take your straight edge, you put it on the frets and measure the gap you end up with down here, right like this. Very, very simple. And uh, add two times what you would like your action to be. And well, since the neck was not straight, I ended up making a giant saddle. Uh, the strings sit about three quarters of an inch off of the neck right now. Um, and that's a lot, um, or three quarters of an inch off of the top. And uh, that's a lot. So, and, and yes, the action was very high because all the math was wonky. Um, so what I found was I really enjoy how anxious the instrument got, how nervous, um, how the difference between every note felt so distinct. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with just the amount of torque I'm creating, um, you know, with a saddle that tall. Um, so I wanna keep this. I don't care what I have to do to this to end up with this and the correct action. So, this is not a guitar that uh, anyone really thought, um, anyone would want to take the neck off of. Um, so, it's, uh, it could be a dialed neck set, um, it could be some sort of tenon, um, but, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but, uh, the paint sort of just washes into that corner. Um, so it's not going to be pretty. Um, I'm gonna, gonna have to cut this paint away as neatly as possible and, uh, separate the neck from the body and do a neck reset to achieve a dramatically higher neck angle. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I'm gonna do in this video. So this neck is not gonna be fun to remove. Um, it's probably uh, some sort of epoxy holding it in. Um, there isn't all that many resources on how this guitar was put together. Um, probably in fitting with its, uh, you know, its retail price was 300 some odd dollars, maybe 400 bucks. Um, so I, I don't think anyone was building this thinking it would be taken apart. But in any case, um, to pull off a neck, we have to soften all of the glue holding it in. Um, there's, there's two main ideas there. You have to separate the tongue extension of the fingerboard and then whatever is the neck joint. Um, there's gonna be two methods 
to pulling off the neck joint. Uh, it, either there's gonna be a tenon that's gonna stick in to approximately the next fret past the body that's pretty standard on all guitars, um, or it'll be a doweled neck set. Um, in that case, it'll be this fret, uh, the body joint fret. Um, I'll be removing from the body joint up in its fretwork. Um, eventually, the whole thing will be refretted, so, you know. Um, but we're gonna remove all of these frets and drill a couple of holes. Those holes uh, will have steam pumped through them. And the steam will hopefully soften the glue that is holding the neck in. Um, that's the hope. Uh, it's very possible that this is put together with a non-water-based glue. Um, and in that case, um, I have a couple of options that don't feel good. Um, I could always cut the neck off, like literally cut the neck off. Um, it doesn't feel good to do that. Um, if I really have a lot of question as to how the neck is put together, I can always cut the fingerboard extension off and see if there's a tenon that's been slipped in if there isn't, I'm pretty obviously looking at a pinned neck set. Um, but uh, I think that's all gonna be stuff I have to just, you know, deal with as it presents itself. Um, so, all right. so removing a fret can be tricky. Um, a lot of the time, a little heat will help, mostly if the fret's been glued in. Um, occasionally, I heat them. Um, I don't normally use solder. In this instance, a little bit of added solder is helping me get enough heat on the fret. Um, sometimes you don't need to heat a fret to get it out. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of like eighties, um, Asian made instruments, the frets come out very, very easily. Um, It all just depends on what guitar it is. Um, and also the piece of wood that was used for the fretboard. Some species of wood are a lot harder to get a fret out of. Um, some are a lot easier. Uh, like Wenge fingerboards, very difficult to get a fret out of. Um, And a lot of the time there will be little chips. There, there absolutely will be. Um, you know, you, you gotta get the fret out and it, it has burrs that will grab. And you know, a lot of the time the chip can be glued back down pretty easily. Um, yeah, you just, just gotta kind of roll with what, what you get removing frets. Um, yeah. So here's a good example of a little chip Just hanging on to the fret. These these frets were glued in. Um, I, I glued them in. So I'm expecting a little bit of chip out. Um, so I am going to be heating this fingerboard extension a lot uh, to get this to come apart. So I'm gonna glue this chip back down, but I'm gonna use a glue with a little bit more heat uh, 
stability. I, I don't want the heat I use to, uh, to fail as I heat the fingerboard off. And you got a little piece of tape. That's, uh, that's all a chip really takes. All right, so now for some fun stuff. Um, we're gonna heat this fingerboard extension off. This is a little hot pad extension off. And I'm gonna cut the paint around the neck. That's the fingerboard lifted to two frets from the body joint. So at this point, I'm going to drill holes for steam and uh, maybe have the first uh, clues as to what kind of neck joint this is. felt the drill kind of find a, uh, a little air pocket in there. So I'll start warming up the espresso machine with the, the steam nozzle and uh, have a go at this. All right, so this is some high pressure steam. Um, it's like, I don't know, 15 PSI. But if it goes in one hole and out the other, we know we have a neck pocket. If it doesn't, these are just two random holes drilled in the head block and less fun. two random holes. Okay, so I did not get steam to exit out of either one of these corresponding holes. Um, the tongue extension has been lifted all the way up to the body joint. I drilled two tiny holes in the last fret. Um, the plan of action right now is this is probably a pinned neck set. Um, I don't fully know. There's really no way to tell. Um, so I'm going to cut it off at the body joint. And to help me locate the scale length and the frets, 
I've drilled these two holes, so there'll be two pins there to locate everything. Um, but for now, this is a saw that is the same width as a fret slot. And uh, very carefully, I'm going to proceed to cut this, cut the binding in the fingerboard and get this, get this fingerboard extension off and take a look at what's under it. Um, ultimately, this is the uh, worst case scenario. This is what you're going to end up doing to figure out what the next course of action is. Um, I don't mind cutting this neck off. Um, if it's pins, a lot of the time I can sit here and soak, soak the steam in and really get it all percolated. And uh, the pins don't exactly fail, but the wood gets soft enough that uh, you can beat the guitar apart is really what starts to happen in a pin neck set. Um, yeah. And then so you get the neck off in a pinned neck set. The thing you do next is you switch the guitar to being a bolt-on. Um, you, you just drill a couple of holes in the head block Mark those into the neck and uh, make the guitar bolt on heel guitar. That's, you know, um, I don't think there's any real loss in that. Um, it was pins, you know, little, little dowels to begin with, so. You know, it's not like we're talking about, uh, you know, the tonal coupling of a, of a dovetail neck joint. Um, but we'll see in a second. But, uh, what this is.
Well, it is a dovetail. Huh. Yeah, a little bit there. That's all just epoxy. Yeah, that wasn't going to fail. Okay, cool. Steam away. All right, so here is the carnage. This is the truss rod. It is tucked into this hole right here. I don't know the construction order on this guitar, but I would assume that the fingerboard was not glued on after the neck, like, you know, some Spanish guitars and, you know, some early Gibsons. But I'm having a lot of trouble getting the neck to slide out because it's bound on that truss rod. So, I'm gonna cut this away. So the day after removing the neck, um, the neck had a little bit of damage here and I don't like how that glue joint looks. So I'm going to try and push it in and maybe get it a little better. Um, I've also got to scrape all the crap off of this thing. Um, this is really common. This is plywood. So, you know. You put a bunch of steam and heat on it, and sometimes you separate the glue joint you weren't intending to separate. And in this case, some of the plywood came off. So I'm going to clean that all up. I have plans of raising the, the end of the fingerboard up in elevation to accommodate the new neck angle. So I'm probably going to glue some strips of, uh, you know, some spruce onto the bottom of this, um, just in preparation of that. So, all right. Uh, I think that this little elastic will work well to clamp this in. Um, it's kind of a weird angle. I've also got some warm water here to soften up the glue around this chip. Um, so yeah, that's what's going to happen now. Here is the tongue extension. I've glued a few pieces of, uh, it's just Adirondack brace material. Um, and this is going to create the lift that the tongue extension will need to be in line with the rest of the neck with a higher neck angle. Um, we have about a 
about quarter of an inch worth of lift that's possible with what I've glued to it and that, that should be really close to what's needed. Um, I am planning a little, little cool thing here. I'm going to trim all this up and then miter the next piece into it. Um, so there'll be some, some like 45 degree angles to cut in what's here. Um, you know, a couple of those, match it in this and put it in. Um, so I'll do that um, before moving over to what's left with the body. So as you can see, there's a bit of tear out in some places here. Being that it's plywood, this is gonna happen. Um, the best thing that I have to do here is route those tears flat and glue in some fresh wood. So let's do that. Now all the patches are glued in. Uh, they all need kind of trimmed to uh, the surface of the instrument. The neck was actually glued onto the paint, so that's what all this is. And I've got to remove that as well so that we get wood to wood glue joint. Um, so you're gonna see me machine this flat real quick with the, with the Dremel and uh, a fixture. And then this is the fingerboard extension. And I'm gonna cut the ramp into the material I glued to the bottom of it. This base was a husk when I got it, meaning that there were no electrical, um, that had all been removed. So I've kind of wired up just a very simple volume and tone with a passive piezo and a, uh, you know, just, an, just a simple jack there. Um, I had made this piece just rosewood um, and I'd like to put a couple of reinforcement strips underneath it so these are just pieces of poplar just simple simple offcut kind of thing um, and this has a little bit of a bend to it so I'm gonna use the bending iron and a little bit of water 
and bend these to match this curve. And then I'll do the, the 45 miter um, in the corners and just, you know, that, that's, that doesn't need bent, that's straight. Um, so, all right, you'll see me do that. Back over to the body and the neck. I'm gonna be doing the neck set. The binding came in pretty nice. Happy with that. Uh, I did fill two little trenches from some of the steam. Um, now I got a little bit more cleaning up to do there. Uh, and there is a there's a shim glued in to the base side of the dovetail. I think I'm gonna thin that shim down a little bit. Um, move the neck over just a pinch. Um, now we got a little bit of a clearance issue in the cutaway. See how all that goes. Um, over here, I dug out around the, the dovetail it's not pretty they never really are um, a lot of that's going to get removed anyways um, so I typically just clean them up at the end um, if needed now something that I do that is controversial whenever I have a dovetail I put a screw into the neck joint um, you don't need a screw, but it helps fit the heel big time. It, it makes the whole neck setting procedure, uh, a lot, lot smoother. Um, you know, it's, it's never the dovetail that fails unless you've cracked the head block. It's normally the shoulders of the guitar, um, flexing inwards that creates the need for a neck reset. Um, this instance, none of that happened. We're just looking for an incredibly high neck angle. Um, but typically I do add this screw. Um, so you'll see, I'll drill a hole in the head block, mark that onto the dovetail of the neck, um, drill that into the neck, and that'll help everything out um, in fitment a lot. So you'll see that. And, uh, I'm going to try a different camera angle. So we're going to, you're going to see more of the workbench.
the final step of this dovetail is going to be shaving down these white shims. Um, they kind of swell the dovetail right at the point there. Um, having removed a lot of material from right here at the at the body joint, a lot of material was removed from here and it sunk into the guitar, right? Um, so the point of the dovetail loosened. So now I've got to make up that space. These are pieces of brass. They're 32 thousandths thick. They uh, can be purchased. A bunch of hobby stores have them. Um, I'm going to make them into bar frets for this base. Uh, this is something I've done before um, that I seem to really enjoy. It's, uh, it leaves a very narrow crown to the fret. Um, Brass also has a very similar uh, wear tendency to your standard fret. Um, and bar frets are nothing new. They've been around for, you know, 70 years, 80 years. Um, a lot of vintage guitars had bar frets before the invention of uh, your standard tanged fret. Um, yeah. I really like this. So basically I cut them down into smaller pieces and uh, I mark a line for their center and then I cut them out and or I cut these in half and I end up with this and then I file the radius of the fingerboard into the bottom uh, so that when I cut the fingerboard referenced off of the fingerboard itself, I end up with the same radius for the slot. Um, yeah, it just gives maximum gluing surface. Um, I've done a couple of tests with these, and uh, when I epoxy them in, they cause lots of wood failure and uh, don't want to come out. Um, in a way that I think is actually better than the result I've gotten with tanged frets. So some of that may just be I'm epoxying a fret in as opposed to, you know, uh, gluing them in with uh, PVA glues or super glues. Um, so yeah. This is my neck fixture. Um, the instrument gets strapped down to this little table and then these dial gauges save the zero point of where the instrument lives when strung to pitch and uh, I use some various different ideas of pushing and pulling on the neck to get the neck to the same place that it was at when the strings were on it tuned to pitch without strings on it. Um, that way, I, when I level this flat and smooth, it's in a straight line. Um, so you'll see me set up this fixture and then move it over to the vise and go about leveling the fingerboard.
Here's the guitar set up in the neck jig. It's uh, strung to pitch, placed in playing position, and zeroed out on all three of the gauges. And now comes the fun stuff of removing the strings and trying to duplicate their effect using the various forces of the jig. Here's the guitar, all keyed into the neck fixture. I've got all the dials reading zero. It's strung up, strung to pitch, and placed in playing position. Now I've got the, the fun part is removing the strings and trying to duplicate their effect on pulling the neck using the various forces of the neck fixture and uh, then leveling the fingerboard. So the board's been leveled. I, uh, I cleaned up the sanding scratches with a scraper. Um, now, these are what will become the fret. This does not fit into the slot. Uh, the slot is a little more narrow than 32 thousandths of an inch. Um, so, I've created a saw here. It's just a piece of stainless steel with a bunch of teeth cut in it. Um, the bigger teeth here, I can bend in and out to create a different thickness slot. Um, so what you're gonna see is, this is a traditional fret slot saw. Um, so this is I had something around 23 thousandths of an inch. Um, I'm going to cut the binding and, uh, some people that's going to be very squeamish for them to watch, but I'm going to cut all of the binding up and down. Um, the fret will extend beyond the, the binding, um, and, uh, be leveled to that surface. Um, and then once I have all the slots nice and clean and at 20 something thousands. The little teeth on this fit into this slot. Um, and I've sanded this side of the saw down to fit into the slot. So you get it in the slot, then the big ones start to open them up. Um, so you're gonna see me open up all of these slots and get them ready for bar frets. Um, that's what's about to happen, so enjoy. Here I have the curve of the fingerboard marked into the fret and I've been cutting that curve in. So this is me getting ready to do the fret job. So I have the frets, I have some five minute epoxy, uh, one side's hardener, one side's resin. So we mix them together and, you know, take a blob as you go. Um, I have a little trick for getting five minute epoxy off of things. And it is a little bit of concrete dust. Yes, concrete, ready, set, 
whatever quick set concrete dust. Um, it does occasionally leave a little grayness in the pores, but with a little bit of some nail polish remover, the uh, natural pigments of the rosewood make that go away. Um, I also lightly oiled the fingerboard with tongue oil. Um, very lightly, I don't want it to actually get into the fret slots, so very, very lightly. Um, but that may actually help in resolving concrete dust in the pores. Um, so yeah, I'll set up the camera and go through installing these frets. So that's all the frets glued in and cleaned up a little bit. Um, I nipped the ends of it as well. Now I'm going to bring the height of the fret down. Uh, I think an interesting thing here uh, is that these frets can be a lot taller than your standard fret. So these are 80 thousandths exposed right now. It's just at random, that's where one of those was. So, and they are installed to a deeper depth than a typical tanged fret. Um, so if, if I wanted, I could make these frets 80 thou tall. Um, that starts to feel like some sort of a scalloped fingerboard. Um, it's, uh, it's not exactly that. The, the neck does feel thicker with a taller fret on it. Um, but, uh, another idea that comes to mind is, uh, for guitars that have slightly lower neck angles, uh, you could sneak 30 thousandths into the height of the, the projected straight line that all the frets create um, and raise the neck angle without having to do a neck reset. Um, that's, that's pretty possible with this. And, uh, you know, in your first position through, uh, you know, middle of the neck, you wouldn't feel that 30 thou worth of lift. Um, but it might give you, you know, two thirty seconds worth of saddle raise. Um, so that, that could help a lot of guitars and, uh, a lot of people who don't want to go as far as a neck reset on their guitar, or maybe their guitar is one of these where neck reset is, you know, financially just not a great idea to do. Um, you know, so there's all of that. Also an interesting thing to note, installing frets with only epoxy, um, as opposed to PVA glues, um, there's no water involved. Um, and without using fret tangs that involve added compression, um, the fingerboard actually stays very straight. Uh, something that you'll find when installing frets uh, that rely on some form of the, the fret walls pinching the tangs of the frets is you will end up with more back bow as the frets get closer together than you do as the frets get further apart. Um, that's just a, a physics thing. Um, with this system, there's no compression. Um, the, the frets are literally held in through adhesion. Um, yeah, that's, and, and no water uh, is added. Uh, yeah, you can install regular frets with epoxy and or super glue, um, but you, with a regular fret, you don't get away from the compression that they add to the, the neck. 
Um, so, all right. Now I'm on to cutting these down to height. And I have a couple of little pieces of wood uh, attached to just, this is an end nipper. Um, and I'm going to try and leave these around 50 or 60 thousandths tall. Um, that would be really nice. Um, and that, that would be a very tall fret. Uh, I, I don't, I think there's like one standard, uh, you know, tanged fret available at the 60 thousandths height before you level it after installing it. So, uh, that'll be tall. Yeah. All right. Here we go. So the guitar is all strung up. I've taped off the fingerboard and trimmed the frets to height. So that's what gets cut off of them. A little thicker at the ends and in the middle. Um, so yeah, strung up now. And, and I spent a bunch of time cleaning the fingerboard. Um, so now it goes back into the neck fixture and uh, I level the frets real quick. And then it's a lot of polishing and cleaning and uh, smoothing out the fret ends. Um, something that is cool about this, there is very little crowning work. Uh, you know, I basically polish out the scratches from leveling the frets and that's about you know, as extensive as that is. Um, so, all right, you'll see that. So here's just the the final assessment of uh, this base. Um, it's fret job, it's working out good. Um, I've got some electrical wired up here with a little piezo thing. Um, it'll go in, I gotta actually take the guitar and blow out the inside cause uh, it's full of stuff. Um, and I added a little thumb rest thing, um, sort of at an interesting point here where now I have the fretwork and the action geometry where I want it, um, and I'm finding that, uh, the strings just, this set of strings just doesn't have the tension I want. Um, there is standard, you know, 45 to 100. And I'm kind of thinking of trying to find some thicker strings. Um, string thickness is a, a big, big part of setting up a guitar. Um, and I know that if I go with thicker strings, I'm probably going to need to kiss the frets a little bit in order to have this as straight as I want it to be. Um, with an increased string tension. Uh, so that'll probably be another video. I'll go through string tension in a few different instances. Um, but right now, I think I'm just going to hang out and play this. I did notice that volume... between the strings is a little lower on my, uh, my low E. 
Um, I think a, a thicker string with a little bit more tension, um, probably a thicker core in it may, may help that a bit. Um, I also, it's just so floppy. I don't exactly enjoy playing this low E. Um, so, but that's, it's good where it is right now.